Um, let me back up for a minute. He starts by saying, Henry V sums up essentially everything he wants to say, everything Shakespeare wants to say about English history and the English history play genre. And he, he mentions how the, that genre play, Shakespeare wasn't the only one writing it, in it um, kind of died out in the 90s. Okay, the farther and farther you got away from 1588, the year of the Spanish Armada, kind of the the emphasis on English nationalism um, died down. Let's say this is right around 98, 99. Yeah, 99, probably um, published around 1600. We know there's a a um, what's called a, a quarto version. It's kind of a, a bad quarto version, probably memorial, memorially reconstructed that dates from around 1600. Um, it was probably somewhat common practice for actors who weren't um, currently in a production to go to competing playhouses with a sheaf of paper and watch a play and copy as much as they could, okay? Or go to a competing playhouse and watch a play multiple times and learn it, just as they would learn their own scripts, okay? And once they thought they had it down, then write it out, and then they could start producing it in their own play. You know, there were no copyright laws in Shakespeare's day. There was no plagiarism, per se. Uh, if you could get a copy of something, you could have it, which is probably one of the reasons why it appears manuscripts of Shakespeare's material was very closely guarded because we have no manuscripts of Shakespeare's plays in his own hand. Um, King, what is it, Henry VIII, uh, there are some notations, some changes in Shakespeare's hand. We have some stuff with where Shakespeare partnered with uh, Thomas Middleton where there are some corrections and additions and things in Shakespeare's own handwriting. But that's it. We don't have any of the sonnets. We don't have any of the poems. We have nothing other than those scraps, literarily, that survived in Shakespeare's hand. Right? <clears throat> we do have six signatures of his. He spells his name, you know, three different ways. So, um, back to the bottom of that page 873. Henry V has become a controversial play Chiefly because our recent experiences with war have led us to be wary of political leaders who in the name of patriotism lay claim to and invade another country. Now if you remember what was said in Henry the one, uh, Henry the fourth part two, Henry the fourth, a dying Henry the fourth, told Prince Hal he needs to do what? He needs to busy giddy minds, okay, with war. Okay? Meaning, he needs to distract them. He needs to get their minds off of what's going on here right now and make them focus on what's going on in a foreign country. Obviously, it's a great way to build nationalism. Okay, I have no doubt that we'll be seeing something like that within the next year or two. Whoever gets elected is probably, we're going to get involved in another kind of war because the country's in um, such dire straits. Okay? So, um, Bevington goes on. Many historically minded critics, on the other hand, that is, people who take a much longer view, okay, the first kind of critics, those who say the play is controversial because we're wary of political leaders, you know, I would kind of say these are very short sighted individuals. These are people who are kind of reading a play written approximately. 415 years ago, from the lens of today, okay, from the mindset of today, more historically minded critics, on the other hand, warn of the dangers of reading um, anachronistically from a modern perspective. They argue that Henry is an admirable model of conduct according to Renaissance notions of statecraft and military leadership. Notice how he puts that. They argue that according to Renaissance models of military leadership and conduct, Henry V is a model. Okay? It's not just that they argue that. That is the case. If you read 
Renaissance manuals of leadership. Okay, what makes a good king? You know, Machiavelli is the prince. Okay, Henry V fits perfectly the model of a good military leader. There, he doesn't do anything in the play that would kind of fall afoul of those models of conduct. All right. So it's not just an argument. It's a fact that he does kind of <coughs> fit those qualities. But what is Shakespeare's attitude toward Henry V? And that's an interesting question that I think we shouldn't only ask about Shakespeare in Henry V. I think we should ask that about all of Shakespeare's protagonists. What does Shakespeare think of Henry IV? What does Shakespeare think of Richard II? What does Shakespeare think of Hamlet, Othello, Macbeth, Lear, Caesar, Romeo and Juliet? Probably not much of Romeo and Juliet, frankly. Uh, what does he think of Duke Theseus in A Midsummer Night's Dream? What does he think of Oberon and Titania? That is, what is the author's attitude towards these characters? Because try as he may, he can't divorce himself from them. He does give clues. Okay. Does he sympathize with Henry's condescension toward the French and his order to kill, uh, his order to every soldier to kill his French prisoners? Or is Shakespeare's admiration qualified by ironic reservations? Does he every now and then undercut that praise that is given? Play pulls us in two directions, Bevington writes. Although the chorus, which interprets the play for us, approves of Henry's military posture, the grandiose rhetoric of war is consistently undercut by matter-of-fact revelations of people's self-interested motivations. Notice that kind of general peoples. He doesn't specify specific specific individuals. We do know. I mean, we're going to see very early on. Who are some people that want Henry to go to war, and why? Archbishop. Pardon? Archbishop yeah, of Canterbury. Archbishop. Why? So he'll get their focus off of him. Yeah, because it'll be good for him. In other words, he has a huge interest in deflecting attention, okay? Some of the others will tell Henry, your barons and dukes, and they're lined up, they're ready to go to war for you. Why? Because it'll deflect attention off them also. Okay? Um, I'm going to skip the rest of that part that I have highlighted. Top of the next page. Skill in rhetoric is a key to Henry's success. I think the choice of determiner there is interesting. Is it a key or is it the key? More so almost than any other character in Shakespeare's plays, Henry V is a master at persuasion. I mean, he could, he could persuade the devil to buy, you know, land in heaven, so to speak, okay? He uses all the tools of rhetoric to persuade. Not just to persuade his nobles and such, to persuade Montjoy, the herald, to persuade the Dauphin and such, to persuade Kate Catherine at the end, okay? And again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show a bunch of clips from um, the Kenneth Branagh version Again, the entire one's not on blind. You can't stream it uh, anymore. You used to be able to stream it if you paid a fee, but it's not streamable. Um, it's very much worth watching for a couple of reasons. One, it's the first film Kenneth Branagh did. I think he's 23 in this, okay? Like a year or two out of college, okay? Um, out of the Royal, uh, I think he was a Rana graduate, Royal Academy for the Dramatic Arts, which he's, either he or Tom Hiddleston is now in charge of. I can't remember which, I think it's him. Yeah, 
uh, it is him, uh, which is an interesting move because he's not high born. Up until him, if I remember correctly, everybody had been the director of Rana has been relatively high born. He's the son of a plumber, if I remember correctly. So he's he's lower middle class or middle class. Okay. Um, what else? He does it when he's 23. It is instantly hailed as possibly the greatest Henry V filmed, at least. At least equal to Lawrence Olivier's in 1944. And I'm going to show a clip from Lawrence Olivier's. I'm going to show a clip of the St. Crispin's Day speech by Kenneth Branagh, Lawrence Olivier, and Tom Hiddleston. Poor Tom Hiddleston, it just falls flat compared to the other two. Right? But the scene at the end, okay, um, between Henry and Catherine, is especially memorable because it's with Emma Thompson, his wife at the time. Just as Much Ado About Nothing was Kenneth Branagh as Benedict and Emma Thompson as Beatrice. They did three or four plays together while they were still married. And the chemistry is just amazing. It's phenomenal. Okay, back to... Um, the introduction for a moment. Henry's versatility as a rhetorician applies to all the vital disciplines of kingship, according to the Archbishop of Canterbury. We're going to see this in just a moment. Henry can reason in divinity, that is, he can think in theology. Okay? He can debate of commonwealth affairs, that is, the affairs that affect the commonwealth of England. He can discourse of war, like Lao Tzu or Sun Tzu, he can handle any cosmopolitan and in all such matters speak in sweet and honeyed sentences, which is a language that was also used to describe Shakespeare in 1598. Spoke of, um, I'm trying to remember the name of the work, but it mentions Shakespeare's sweet and sugared sonnets. Okay? Um, Go on down in that paragraph, towards a uh, little over halfway beyond it, um, through the middle. We realize that the public figure of Henry is a mass behind which we can perceive little. Well, what did we see when we almost first met Hal in Henry the Fourth, Part One? He delivers that soliloquy when he says, "I know all of you." And what does he tell? What does he tell us? He's talking about that mask he wears. Falstaff, Pito, Bardolph, Pons, they're not aware of any mask. They think the Henry they see is the real Henry. Okay? He has to tell his father, Dad, look, I'm wearing a mask. Don't worry, everything will be fine. It's reiterated again in Henry the Fourth, Part Two. Okay? It's alluded to at the beginning of this play when the Archbishop is talking. Okay? Um, Bevington goes on. King Henry has accepted the responsibility of playing a political role. It denies him a private and separate identity, even or especially in choosing a wife. Now, this is a real interesting theme in this series of plays. The political versus the private in terms of the king. We saw it. We didn't talk about because we didn't have class, but it's on the lecture that I had online. We saw it in Richard II. We see it in both Henry IV, parts one and two, with both Henry IV and Hal, and we see it in Henry V. Okay? It's an issue that Shakespeare really appears to have wrestled with. How can a monarch, you know, in one sense, live? Because the monarch is kind of constantly doing this, putting on, taking off these two different personas, the public persona, the private persona. The public doesn't see the private persona. When does the private persona even have a chance to actually be? We're going to see it briefly here when what does the king do? He puts on Erpingham's cloak and he walks around in, his, in a disguise. And he talks to people, notice, in disguise to get what? What kind of information? What's he getting from his troops in that scene? 
morale is how they view him. How the morale is how they view him in, in trying to elicit the right response. In, in what form? Or in what manner? Well, it's not guarded because he has a disguise. It's honest. It's the unvarnished truth. You know, one of the things you hear about presidential cabinets is that unfortunately, too many presidents surround themselves with what kind of people? Yes, men. Yes, men. You're the greatest one. You know the best. You don't ever do anything wrong. You have the best ideas. Rather than, are you flipping out of your mind? This is a crazy, stupid idea. Okay? Because what's a president going to do? Well, I don't really like that because you opposed me, so I'm going to, you know, ship you off to outer Podunkville or something. It denies him a private and separate identity, even or especially choosing a wife. Right? Why does he choose Catherine? So they don't have to get work. Okay, yeah. She's, you know, not the heir to the French throne, but she's related to the heir to the French throne. He has the English throne. He marries her, and what happens? Boom! You unite the two countries. It still happens. <laughs> and it complicates our task of assessing the sincerity of his utterances. How do we know when the king is being truthful? Well, there is a stage device. There's a dramatic device that tells us when. If he gets a soliloquy, we know he's being truthful. Okay? That's one of the things that makes this different from, say, Hamlet. Hamlet gets an awful lot of soliloquies. He also has a very famous speech that is described as a soliloquy, yet it's not. Hamlet's Act 3, Scene 1, To Be or Not to Be Speech, frequently called the greatest soliloquy in the English language. It's not a soliloquy. There are other people on the stage when he delivers that speech. Got it? So, we've got all this to deal with as the play opens. So it opens with the chorus. Let me... Uh, Kill these lights a little bit. Yeah, there we go. Derek Jacoby doing the chorus for us. Hold on, let me. Oh, on the leaves of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention. himself assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, to famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment. But pardon, gentles all, the flat, unraised spirits that have dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth so great an object. Can this cockpit hold the vasty fields of France? Or may we cram within this wooden oak the very casks that did affright the air at Ashcombe? Oh, pardon. And let us ciphers to this great account on your imaginary forces work. What is your force that now must deck our tools? Carry them here and there, jumping all time, turning the accomplishment of many years into an hour of life. For the which supply, admit me. Call us to this history. Who? Trollers like your humble patience prays. Gently to hear, kindly to judge. Our play! Okay. 
stop that. <clears throat> Pick up then with 1-1. One, one. Um, and I want to pick up with Canterbury at about line, uh, I don't know, 20 or so. Maybe not 20, 22 or so. The king is full of grace and fair regard. Ely, and a true lover of the Holy Church. The courses of his youth promised it not, we're told. Okay, What are they talking about? Hell! Uh, in Henry the, Henry the Fourth, Part 1. The courses of his youth promised it not. The breath no sooner left his father's body, but that his wildness mortified in him, in him seemed to die too. Well, didn't it seem to die a little bit earlier? I mean, Shrewsbury? Yea, at that very moment, consideration, like an angel, came and whipped the offending Adam out of him. There's that idea of reformation again that we talked about last week. The old Adam and the new Adam. Leaving his body as a paradise to envelop and contain celestial spirits. He's been purified. Never was such a sudden scholar made. Never came reformation in a flood with such a heady current scouring faults. Nor never hydra-headed willfulness. They're describing what hell was like before. Like the hydra. Cut one head off, three more grow, right? In other words, no matter what was done to curb his wildness, he'd be even more wild seemingly. So soon did lose his seat and all at once, as in this king. They're talking about their surprise at how he has become king-like. We are blessed in the change. And that's when Canterbury delivers this kind of beautiful speech. Hear him but reason in divinity, and all admiring with an inward wish you would desire the king were made a prelate. You hear him talk about theology and you would wish... This guy were a bishop or archbishop. Hear him debate of commonwealth affairs. You would say it has been all in all his study. All in all? Entirely. That's what he'd spent his life on. List his discourse of war. And you shall hear a fearful battle rendered you in music. Turn him to any cause of policy. That is, to any issue affecting the state. The Gordian knot of it, he will unloose. That is, the most difficult portion he'll find the solution to. Familiar as his garter, that when he speaks the air, a chartered libertine is still. Why is the air a chartered libertine? Look at your footnote. Free spirit, licensed to roam at will. Because the air is, as Shakespeare describes, time is, in one of the sonnets, a slut. It sleeps with everyone. It goes with everyone. And the mute wonder lurketh in men's ears to steal his sweet and honeyed sentences. So that the art and practic part of life must be the mistress to this theoric, to this theory. Which is a wonder how his grace should glean it, since his addiction was to courses vain. His companies unlettered, that is, the people he hung around with, unlettered, rude, and shallow. His hours filled up with riots, banquets, sports, and never noted in him any study. People never once saw him crack a book open. Any retirement, any sequestration from open haunts and popularity. They never saw him go off silently to a room to study. He was always, where? Open haunts and popularity. The strawberry grows underneath the nettle. What's a nettle? So stinging. A stinging thorny plant. And wholesome berries thrive and ripen best, neighbored by fruit of baser quality. And so the prince obscured his contemplation under the veil of wildness, <coughs> which no doubt grew like the summer grass. That is, the veil of wildness like summer grass 
just grew rampant. Fastest by night, unseen, yet crescent in his faculty. It must be so. For miracles are ceased. What does the Archbishop of Canterbury mean? Miracles are ceased. That is a Reformation idea. That is a theologically reformed idea, which was miracles stopped with the close of the canon of Scripture, the book of Revelation. Once the Scripture was canonized as the New Testament, beginning around, one, around 175 or so, 176 in the letter of St. Athanasius the Great of Alexandria, boom, miracles stopped, according to the Reformed theologians. John Calvin, Martin Luther, Savonarola, uh, not Savonarola, um, Zwingli in Switzerland. So, Miracles are ceased, and therefore we must needs admit the means how things are perfected. That is, therefore there must be some rational way how he got to be the way he is. Ely. Okay, so what about this bill that we have? How now for the mitigation of this bill urged by the comments? That is, how do we get it squashed? Doth the mag his majesty incline to it or no? He seems indifferent, or rather swaying more upon our part than cherishing the exhibitors against us. He says, For I've made an offer to his majesty upon our spiritual convocation in regard of causes now in hand, which I have opened to his grace at large. What's the offer? You scratch our back, we'll scratch yours. So notice what's going on here. At the heart, one of the church, but also at the, um, I almost said papacy, monarchy. Deal making. Okay. How did he receive this offer? Ely asks. With good acceptance of his majesty. Line 84. Save that there was not time enough to hear, as I perceived his grace would fain have done, the several and un unhidden passages of his true titles to some certain dukedom. What's he talking about? He's talking about what we're going to see in the next long portion of this scene. When they come in with the king, I'm trying to remember, do I have a clip of this? No. Um, yes. Um, where they come in and the king asks questions about, do I have lawful claim? He's going to say, line 96, May I with right and conscience make this claim? What's the claim? Speaking France. Throne of France. Is that crown of France? Can I lawfully make this claim? Notice he's turning to the spiritual lords for this. Okay? I think this is the scene. This is Henry's first entrance into the play. proceed and justly and religiously unfold why the law selling that they have in France or should or should not bar us in our claim. And pray take heed how you inform our person. 
how you awake our sleeping sword of war. We charge you in the name of God, take heed. For never two such kingdoms did contend without much fall of blood. Then hear me, gracious sovereign. There is no bar to make against your highness claim to front. But this, which they produce from Faramont. In terum serica mulieris ne succeedent, no woman shall succeed in Salic land. Which Salic land the French unjustly close to be the realm of France. Yet their own author faithfully affirm that the land Salic lies in Germany between the floods of Tsar and the Welt. Then doth it well appear this Salic law was not devised for the realm of France. Nor did the French possess the Salic land until 420 years after the function of King Pharamond, I should suppose the founder of this law. <sighs> King Pepin, which deposed Childeric, did as heir general, being descended of Blifield, which was the daughter to King Clothair, make claim the title to the crown of God. Hugh Capit also, who usurped the crown of Charles the Duke of Lorraine, sole heir male of the true line and stock of Charles the Great, could not keep quiet in his conscience, wearing the crown of France to satisfy the fair Queen Isabel, his grandmother, was Lilial of the Lady Erminga, daughter to Charles, the aforesaid Duke of Lorraine, by the which marriage the line of Charles the Great was reunited to the crown of France. So that as clear as is the summer sun, <laughs> all appear to hold in right and title of the female. So do the kings of France unto this day. How be it? They would hold up this Salic law to bar your highness claim from the female. May I, with right and conscience, make this claim? The sin upon my head, dread sovereign. <laughs> Stand for your own, and your bloody flag. Your brother kings and monarchs of the earth do all expect that you should rouse yourself, as did the former lions of your blood. Never king of England had nobles richer, more loyal subjects whose hearts have left their bodies here in England, and thy pavilion in the fields of France. Who oh, let their bodies follow, my dear liege, blood and sword and fire to win your right. In aid of their arms, Feel the spirituality. Raise your highness such a mighty sum as never did the clergy at one time bring into any of your ancestors. Call in the messengers sent from the Dauphin. Now are we well resolved, and by God's help and yours, the noble sinews of our power. France being ours, we'll bend it to our all. Or break it all to pieces. Now are we well prepared to know the pleasure of our fair cousin Dauphin. Your Highness, lately sending into France, did claim some certain dukedoms and the right of your great predecessor, King Edward III. In answer of which claim, the Prince, my master, says that you savour too much of your youth. He therefore sends you, metre for your spirit, this ton of treasure. And in lieu of this, desires you let those dukedoms that you claim hear no more of you. This, the Dauphin speaks. What? Notice the music. Oh, it's Exeter. Tennis balls, my liege. We are glad that Telfair is so pleasant with us. These 
present and your pains we thank you for. When we have matched our rackets to these balls, we will in France, by God's grace, play a set. Shall strike his father's crown into the hazard, and we understand him well. How he comes o'er us with our wilder days, not measuring what use we made of them. But tell the Dauphin, I will keep my state, be like a king, and show my sail of greatness when I do rouse me in my throne of France. And tell the pleasant prince, this mock of his have turned his balls to gunstones, and his soul shall stand sore charged for the wasteful vengeance that shall fly with them. A many a thousand widows shall this his mock, mock out of their dear husbands, mock mothers from their sons, mock castles down, and some are yet ungotten and unborn that shall have cause to curse the do fair school. So get you hence in peace, and tell the Dauphin his jest will save a lot of shallow wit when thousands weep more than did laugh at it. Hello. Okay. Um, go back for a moment. Let me turn that up just a little bit more. <clears throat> back for a moment to where the king was speaking um, in Act 1, Scene 2. And Ely and Exeter started to speak, um, they brain are completely omitted, uh, omitted lines 115 through about 120, okay? We heard Canterbury, you know, right after he says, the sin upon my head, dread sovereign, okay? He then go, says, go my dread lord to your great grandsire's tomb from whom you claim invoke his warlike spirit and your great uncle's Edward the Black Prince. What he's doing there is he's appealing to Henry's sense of kind of family glory. I mean, he comes from this long line of warrior princes, warrior kings. And the Archbishop of Canterbury and an alien Exeter are all essentially saying, and you too must be a warrior prince. And if you're not, then you're not living up to your family name. Ely, line 115, awake remembrance of these valiant dead, and with your puissant arm renew their feet, you are their heir. That is, these valiant dead, those that have died before, not people who have died in a current skirmish, okay, but your ancestors. You are their heir, you sit upon their throne, the blood and courage that renowned them runs in your veins. Okay? Who was referred to? Your great uncle, Edward the Black Prince one of the most feared of all English knights. All right? um, your brother kings and monarchs of the earth, Exeter says, do all expect that you should rouse yourself as did the former lions of your blood. In other words, this is what kings do. If you don't do this, what's going to happen? Think of it in terms of the current political contest. You, okay, you lose. Possibly more civil war. Or you'll get taken advantage of by these other kings and monarchs of the earth. Okay? Westmoreland. They, these other kings and monarchs. He's talking about European kings. The king of Spain. Okay? King of France, obviously. King of Germany. The Netherlands, Portugal, um, they know your grace hath cause and means and might. In other words, you've got everything going for you that you need for this battle. So hath your highness. Never king of England had nobles richer and more loyal subjects, whose hearts have left their bodies here in England and lie pavilion in the fields of France. He means... My liege, we are already mentally there. Moreover, we're wealthy. <laughs> we, can, we can pay for this war. See, 
Henry's ans um, yeah. ancestors often were poor and didn't have the funds, didn't have the means. King John, okay, didn't have the means. It's why he taxed the people again and again and again, which resulted in Magna Carta in 1215, okay? <laughs> Canterbury, oh, let their bodies follow my dear liege. In other words, their hearts are already in France. Let their bodies follow with blood and sword and fire to win your right, okay? So then Brana skips a bunch, and he says, send in the messenger from the Dauphin. The Dauphin is the prince of France, okay? So we have a prince, we have a princess, and we have the king. Henry is claiming the throne, okay? This is part of the Hundred Years' War. It's kind of the beginning of the Hundred Years' War. Henry's king, uh, about 1415 to 1425, something like that. I think I'm a little wrong on the 1415 part. Um, it's, it's the Hundred Years' War actually began around 1340 because Geoffrey Chaucer fought in the Hundred Years' War as a 16-year-old. Okay, he was born around 1346 or so. So they come, the, the messenger comes in and delivers the Dauphin's tennis balls. Why does he bring tennis balls? What's the joke here? What's the Dauphin saying he's to... He's still a kid. He likes to play games. He's still a kid and likes to play games. Notice Henry's response. We are glad the Dauphin is so pleasant with us. His present in your pains we thank you for. When we have matched our records to these balls, we will in France, by God's grace, play a set shall strike his father's crown into the hazard. He takes the gift and turns it into a metaphor for battle. Tell him he hath made a match, and a lot of this was omitted, with such a wrangler that all the courts of France will be disturbed with chases. And we understand him well, how he comes over us with our wilder days. The Dauphin is thinking merely about what? Prince. Prince how? The reputation he has heard. Has the Dauphin ever met Hal? Has the Dauphin ever been at one of these bars that Hal? No, he hasn't. It's entirely, you know, kind of the media portrayal, so to speak. Not measuring what use we made of them. What use he made of what? Our wilder days. Yeah. <laughs> What use did he make of those wilder days? He learned how to fight. Okay. Keep going. He learned how common people like discuss things and he basically learned like everything. Okay. What's the real use? What is what is the Dauphin I think of the king? He's still a child, but he sowed all his wild oats back then. He got yeah. rid of it all. The use he's made is the reputation that everybody thinks of him. Which is what? He's a child. Yeah, that's the reputation. Is it true? No. That's the use. Notice what he's done. He's put out a false narrative about himself so that people think he's untried, he's untested, he's unworthy, he's incapable, he's un-everything. And what does this little speech show? Oh, no. <laughs> no, he's not. He's ready. We never valued this poor seat of England, and therefore living hence, that is, not in this seat, not as king, did give ourselves to barbarous license, as tis ever common that men are merriest when they are from home. But, tell the Dauphin, I will keep my state, be like a king, and show my sail of greatness when I do rouse me in my throne of France. That is, when he says, show my sail of greatness, he's kind of implying, raise my sail of war. 
For that I have laid by my majesty and plotted like a man for working days, that is, acted like a commoner. But I will rise there with so full of glory that I will dazzle all the eyes of France. Has he dazzled all the eyes of England? Yeah. He's doing a pretty darn good job of it at this point. Yea, strike the Dauphin blind to look on us. He doesn't mean literally. He means he is going to be so amazed when he sees me. And tell the pleasant prince, this mock of his hath turned his balls to gunstones. He's not talking about his balls. He's talking about the tennis balls. He sent tennis balls to England. England is going to send what back? Cannonballs. That's what gunstones are. And his soul shall stand sore charged for the wasteful vengeance that shall fall fly with them. That is, the cannibals will bring vengeance. For many a thousand widows shall this his mock, mock out of their dear husbands. Mock mothers from their sons. Mock castles down. And some are yet ungotten and unborn that shall have cause to curse the Dauphin's scorn. But this lies all within the will of God, to whom I do appeal, and in whose name tell you the Dauphin, I am coming on to venge me as I may, and to put forth my rightful hand in a well-hallowed cause. So get you hence in peace, and tell the Dauphin, his jest will savor but of shallow wit, bad taste, poor joke. When thousands weep more than did laugh at it. Well, how many laughed at it? Nobody in the king's presence. Okay. Exeter. That was a merry message. In other words, well done, you know. We hope to make the cinder blush at it. Not Montjoy the Herald, but the Dauphin. Therefore, my lords, omit no happy hour that may give furtherance to our expedition. In other words, let's get the ball rolling. Let's start our planning. Okay? So we get Act 2. Notice how quickly Act 1 went past. And the chorus comes out. Now all the youth of England are on fire, and silk and dalliance in the wardrobe lies. Now thrive the armorers. What does that mean, and silk and dalliance in the wardrobe lies? Yeah, they put away all the nice, fine, silken clothes. Why? Because now they're wearing their cotton and their wool under their armor. They're getting ready for battle. Now thrive the armorers, and honor's thought reigns solely in the breast of every man. Now it's like England is full of hot spurs. They sell the pasture now to buy the horse following the mirror of all Christian kings with winged heels as English mercuries. They sell the pasture to buy a horse. Why? So they can go to battle? What about when they come home? <laughs> they don't have the land anymore. What's, what's, the king say, uh, what's the chorus saying? What has happened to the English nation, the English populace? It's gone down. Nope. They're sort of in over their heads. Or, well, um, uh, they're, prepared to die. they're prepared to die. They're roused for war. That's all they're thinking about. Okay. Now sits expectation in the air and hides a sword from hilts unto the point with crowns imperial, crowns and coronets. That is, the high and mighty, so to speak. Promised to Harry and his followers. The French, advised by good intelligence of this most dreadful preparation, shake in their fear. Well, keep in mind, this is told from an English chorus. And the English chorus is saying the French are, oh, let's use a phrase that was used around, I don't know, 2002, 2003, you know, cheese-eating surrender monkeys. There the French are over there, quaking in their boots. Why? 
because the English are about to descend on them. They seek to divert the English purposes. O oh, England, model to thy inward greatness like little body with a mighty heart. What mightst thou do that honor would thee do, that honor desires you to do? Were all thy children kind and natural? But see, thy fault France hath in thee found out a nest of hollow bosoms. Hollow bosoms, meaning what? No heart. No heart. No Englishness. No Englishness. No, what's, what's really there about no heart? Honor. Yes, no moral compass. What's the nest of hollow bosoms? What's going to happen immediately after this speech? The traitors. The three traitors are, are found out. Okay. Their chests are hollow so they can be filled with French designs, French plots, French ideas against the king. Uh, a nest of hollow bosoms which he fills with treacherous crowns. Crowns, the ref reference to money, okay, as well as the French crown, a treacherous crown. And three corrupted men, one Richard, Earl of Cambridge, and the th uh, second, Henry, Lord Scroop of Masham. And the third, Sir Thomas Gray, Knight of Northumberland. He's not the Duke of Northumberland. He's just from Northumberland. Um, half for the guilt of France. Oh, guilt indeed. Notice Shakespeare. Pun. He loves them. Confirmed conspiracy with fearful friends. And by their hands this grace of kings must die if hell and treason hold their promises ere he take ship for France and in Southampton. In other words, they're going to try and kill the king. Okay? So, the chorus gives us the names of the three traitors, but it doesn't give us any other information. Your introduction talks about this. It's kind of odd. Shakespeare, when he usually has traitors, kind of gives you both sides. He gives you the rationale for why the traitors are traitors, okay? The Cambridge that's mentioned here is the person who, contra Henry, has a claim to the throne. Okay? Henry's claim to the throne is, Dad stole it. <laughs> he died, passed it down to me. Richard, was it Richard? Earl of Cambridge, yeah, Richard, Earl of Cambridge, has a blood claim to the throne. Blood always trumps theft. Okay? So, we see the king come in with these others. But not really in the... Right. I've got a clip here. Let me go back. Prologue, pause. Yeah, here it is. Ted Cruz is the only candidate who has taken on the Washington cartel time after time. Please. Ted Cruz went to the... Who are the late commissioners? I won my lord. Your Highness bade me ask for it today. So did you mean my name? And I'm not also. Then Richard Earl of Cambridge, there is yours. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. I gotta back this up. Lights come back on. Back up for a minute, because that clip skips an awful lot. Um, go to line 12, Act 2. Now sits the wind fair, and we will aboard. My Lord of Cambridge and my Lord of Masham, and you, my gentle knight, give me your thoughts. So, Cambridge, Scroop, and Gray. He's asking, I need your opinions. Think you not that the powers we bear with us will cut their passage through the force of France, doing the execution and the act for which we have in head assembled them? Do you think we have sufficient power and means and men to achieve our goals in France? Scroop. No doubt, my liege, if each man do his best. I doubt that, not that, since we are well persuaded. We carry not a heart with us from hence that grows not in fair consent with ours. That is... I don't think we have any problems since everybody's in agreement with us. Okay. 
Never was monarch better feared and loved than is your majesty, says Cambridge. Gray, true, those that were your father's enemies have steeped their galls in honey and do serve you with hearts create of duty and of zeal. So all three suck up to him. King. Okay. We judge no less. Uncle of Exeter. So he turns from them to his uncle, which in the film is played by Brian Blessed, the guy with the big beard. He's one of my favorite English actors. Uncle of Exeter, enlarged the man committed yesterday that railed against our person. We consider it was excess of wine that set him on, and on his more advice, we pardon him. Kind of just opposite of Donald Trump, who wants to arrest people, you know, who don't like him and you know, says if he gets elected, he's going to change the libel laws and stuff. Scroop. That's mercy, but too much security. That is, you, okay, are placing too much security in this guy's freedom. You think you're too safe if you give this person freedom who railed against you. Let him be punished, sovereign, lest example breed by his sufferance more of such kind. You let one loud mouth go, you're going to breed more. Oh, let us be merciful. So may your highness and yet punish too. You could be merciful, but you could beat him, you know. Gray, sir, you show great mercy if you give him life after the taste of much correction, see. Scourge him, let the man be scourged, you know, and then let him walk. Alas, you're too much love and care for me are heavy orisons, prayers against this poor wretch. If little faults Proceeding on distemper shall not be winked at. How shall we stretch our eye when capital crimes, chewed, swallowed, and digested, appear before us? What's he getting at? You can't treat everybody the same. Like if they do one little thing or if they do a big thing, they can't both go. True? Also, you, you're traitors. Okay, I mean, obviously that. But he's, the king is talking about this notion of justice versus mercy. They're all for justice. Let justice be done. And then if you want to show a little mercy, yeah, let him walk away if he can still walk. Okay? The king's like, no, I'm going to show mercy. Okay? We'll yet enlarge that man, though Cambridge, Scroop, and Gray, in their dear care and tender preservation of our person, would have him punished. And now to our French causes. Who are the late commissioners? Go back down here. Back this up a bit. My Lord of Westmoreland, Uncle Exeter, we will abort tonight. Oops. <laughs> but how now, gentlemen? What see you in those papers that you lose so much complexion? I do confess my fault, and do submit me to your highness' mercy. Which we all appeal. The mercy that was quick in us of late by your own counsel is suppressed and killed. You must not dare for shame. Talk of mercy. Your own will be turned into your bosoms as dogs upon their masters. What is it? See, you, white princes of our noble peers, these English monsters. What shall I say to thee, Lord Scoop? Thou cruel, evil, grateful. Savage and inhuman creature. That it's bear a key of all my counsels, that knew at the very bottom of my soul, that almost might stuff coined me into gold, which thou have practiced on me for thy use. May it be possible that foreign hire could out of thee extract one spark of evil that might annoy my finger. It is so strange. But though the truth of it stand off as gross as black and white, my eye will scarcely see it. So, 
constant and unspotted didst thou see. It is thy form that left a kind of blot to mark the full thought thereat, and best endued with some suspicion. I will weep for thee, for this revolt of thine, methinks, is like another form of man. I rest here by treason by the name of Richard, Earl of Cambridge. I rest here by treason by the name of Thomas Gray, Knight of Northumberland. I rest here by treason by the name of Henry Lord Stoop of Massam. Give me your sentence. You have conspired against our royal person, joined with an enemy proclaimed Whoa. on his coffin, to the result of the of our death, wearing no. the sword of king to slaughter, his princes and his peers to servitude, his subjects to oppression and contempt, and his whole kingdom into desolation. Therefore, hence, poor, miserable, wretched team of death. The taste whereof God of his mercy give you patience to endure, and true repentance of all your dear offenses. That wasn't supposed to happen. Okay, um, go back to what the king says. Uh, Lines start with 78. The mercy that was quick in us but late by your own counsel is suppressed and killed. You must not dare for shame to talk of mercy, for your own treasons, own reasons, turn into your bosoms as dogs upon their masters worrying you. The person that they were saying before should be punished was to be punished for what kind of crime? Being drunk yeah. He railed against our person. You know, libel, maybe. Or slander, possibly. They're guilty of treason. Okay? And they're begging for mercy. So the king says, See you, my princes, my noble peers, these English monsters, my lord of Cambridge here, you know how, how apt our love was to accord to furnish him with all the pertinence belonging to his honor. And this man, and I think the king is suggesting there, because of who he is and his blood, I didn't withhold anything from him. And this man hath for a few light crowns lightly conspired and sworn under the practices of friends to kill us here in Hampton. Uh, to the which this knight, no less for bounty bound, us, bound to us than Cambridge, is hath likewise sworn. But oh, what shall I say to thee, Lord Script, thou cruel and grateful savage and inhuman creature? Thou didst bear the key of all my counsels that knew the very bottom of my soul. Implying there's a relationship there, a closeness there, that there wasn't with Gray and um, Cambridge. That almost wouldst have coined me into gold, which thou have practiced on me for thy use. May it be possible that foreign hire could out of thee extract one spark of evil that might annoy my finger. Tis so strange that though the truth of it stands off as gross as black and white, my eye will scarcely see it. Treason and murder ever kept together as two yoke devils sworn to either's purpose, working so grossly in a natural cause that admiration did not whoop of them. Okay, skip down a little bit. Um, to... Line 139. I will weep for thee, for this result of thine, me think, revolt of mine, excuse me, methinks is like another fall of man. Here's that reformation idea, that sin and reformation idea. Their faults are open, arrest them to the answer of the law. What does he mean when he says it's like another fall of man? If it's like another fall of man, then what was it like before? Their treasons were unveiled. 
The king is saying, it was like paradise for me. In other words, he trusted everyone. Everyone was doing their proper work. Nobody was disobedient. And these three trusted advisors turn against him. Okay? Scroop. Because he isn't going to speak here. Our purposes God justly hath discovered. What does that mean, discovered? Revealed. He's saying God, in his wisdom, justly revealed our purposes, our plots to you. And I repent my fault more than my death, which I beseech your highness to forgive, although my body pay the price of it. Notice, he is saying, I know I'm going to die. But I ask for your forgiveness. He's not asking at this point, don't kill me. Okay? Cambridge. For me, the gold of France did not seduce. Although I did admit it as a motive, the sooner to effect what I intended. But God be thanked for prevention, that is for being stopped, which I in sufferance heartily will rejoice, beseeching God and you to pardon me. Gray, never did faithful subject more rejoice at the discovery of most dangerous treason than I do at this hour. Joy over myself. He's thankful that he wasn't kind of allowed to carry it out. Prevented from a damned enterprise. My fault, but not my body. Pardon, sovereign. What's he asking for? All three of them. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Why? Because they're about to die. Keep going. Oh, well, because I think they, they like the king, love the king, and they made a mistake, and they know that. And they know they're going to die. And they know they're going to die. You have to repent of your sins. Yeah, in the Christian tradition. You repent of your sins. Okay. Not only you repent of your sin, you ask forgiveness. Why? So that those sins aren't held against you. Okay. We're going to see the same thing in Hamlet. Hamlet's going to beg Laertes' forgiveness. Laertes is going to beg Hamlet forgiveness. We kind of saw it with Hotspur. Okay. Not fully developed. The king, God quit you in his mercy. Quit, requite. God forgive you in his mercy. Hear your sentence. In other words, the king is essentially saying, it's up to God to do that. You've conspired against a royal person. You joined with an enemy proclaimed and from his coffers. Receive the golden earnest of our death, wherein you would have sold your king to slaughter, his princes and his peers to servitude, his subjects to oppression and contempt. That is, it's not just me you did this against. You did it against the other men, okay, that were there. And what else? You also did it against... Go back there for a moment. Make sure it doesn't start. You also did it against the entire realm. Touching our person, seek we no revenge. So he's saying it's a sin against multiple people? Yeah, it's a sin against the country. That's what he's saying. So, for what you've done against me, I don't seek any revenge. But we, line 174, but we are kingdom safety must so tender, whose ruin you have sought, that to her laws we do deliver you. It's your sin against England. That's the cause of your impending deaths. Get you therefore hence, poor miserable wretches, to your death. The taste whereof God of his mercy gives you patience to endure and true repentance of all your dear offenses. Bear the mints. Okay? I'm going to skip 2-3. Go to 2-4. Okay? Actually, am I doing 2-4? Yes. I have a question. Yes. Um, in this line where it says, the taste where of God of his mercy gives. Is, is he saying that only God can give them mercy? Or is he saying... Yeah, ultimately. Ultimately? Because they're kind of God-like figures, not really, but they're... You know, well, I mean... Received that way, I guess. They're nobles. Yeah. But he's saying, may God in heaven grant you mercy 
for your repentance. That is, you know, as long as you're really repenting, God promises mercy to the repentant. Okay. And the, the line continues, give you patience to endure and true repentance. Of all your dear offenses. Yeah. yeah. So, so it kind of goes back to that idea of justice and mercy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in a, in a again, in a kind of Christian tradition, you don't ever want to beg for justice. I mean, justice is always hell <laughs> if you're talking in a Christian tradition. Okay, you always want to beg for for um, mercy. So they take them out, and the king says, "Now, lords, for France, the enterprise whereof shall be to you as." Us, like glorious, we doubt not of a fair and lucky war, since God so graciously hath brought to light this dangerous treason lurking in our way to hinder our beginnings. We doubt not now, but every rub is smooth on our way. In other words, from here on, smooth sailing. Then forth, dear countrymen, let us deliver our puissance into the hand of God. Let us give our power, our strength, into the hand of God. Meaning, again, this is all rhetoric. Let the English fist become the scourge of God on France. Okay? Um, 2 4, we see the Dauphin speaking with his father, the French king. Okay? And the Dauphin, is, or the Dauphin is, is speaking lightly of King Henry or Harry. And the constable says, Line 30 or so. Start with 29, I guess. O oh, peace, Prince Dauphin. You are too much mistaken in this king. That is, Harry. Question your grace, the late ambassadors. With what great state he heard their embassy. How well supplied with noble counselors. How modest in exception. And withal, how terrible in constant resolution. And you shall find his vanities forespent were but the outside of the Roman Brutus, covering discretion with a coat of folly. As gardeners do with order, hide those roots that shall first spring and be most delicate. What is meant by gardeners hiding with order those roots until the spring? Just one second, Jessica. Covering with manure the ground. And what's going to come out of that ground? Those shoots of plants. He's saying, that king, he only covered himself with manure for a reason. Okay, Jessica, you had your hand up? Yeah, who was um, constable? The constable's like the chief military officer of uh, France. Okay, so the Dauphin says, tis not so, my lord high constable. But though we think it so, it is no matter. In cases of defense, it is best to weigh the enemy more mighty than he seems. In other words, let's, you know, let's, let's kind of take the negative approach, and let's say things are going to be worse than they probably actually are. Let's think the enemy is stronger than what we know him to be. Complete 180 from his suggestion at first. Yeah. <laughs> so the proportions of defense are filled, which of a weak and niggardly projection doth like a miser spoil his coat with scanting a little cloth. The French king now speaks. Think we King Harry strong. Notice it's not a question. And princes, look you strongly armed to meet him. The kindred of him hath been fleshed upon us. That is, his ancestors have pressed their flesh upon us in the past. And France hasn't always come off very well. And he is bred out of that bloody strain that haunted us in our familiar paths. Witness our too much memorable shame when Cressy battle fatally was struck, and all our princes captived by the hand of that black name, Edward, Black Prince of Wales. One of the huge losses in the Hundred Years' War for France. Whilst that his mountain sire on mountain standing, up in the air, crowned with the golden sun, saw his heroical seed and smiled to see him mangle the work of nature and deface the patterns that by God and by French fathers had 20 years been made. In other words, he's saying, don't underestimate him. He comes from the same blood as Edward the Black Prince. Okay? So, ambassadors come from England. 
and it's Exeter. And Exeter delivers a speech and says, The king greets your majesty. He wills you in the name of God Almighty that you divest yourself and lay apart the borrowed glories that by gift of heaven, by law of nature and of nations, longs, that is belongs, to him and to his heirs, namely the crown. Okay, notice, you divest yourself, divest yourself and lay apart the borrowed glories. Now, if you go far enough back in English history, maybe that's like, you know, the um, property of Anjou, or Normandy, or Aquitaine even. Okay? No, 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 no. Henry V wants it all. The entire kingdom. And all the wide stretched honors, stretched honors that pertain by custom and ordinance of times unto the crown of France. Okay? And so he gives them a paper laying out the English claim to the throne. So he says, he bids you then resign your crown and kingdom indirectly held from him the native and true talent challenger. Or what? You know, throwing a Jersey accent. Oh, what you gonna do? Okay. Bloody constraint. For if you hide the crown, even in your hearts, there will he rake for it. He'll cut your heart out. Therefore, in fierce tempest is he coming. And then listen to the language. This is Shakespeare at his best. Therefore, in fierce tempest he is coming, in thunder and in earthquake, like a Jove, that if requiring fail, he will compel, and bid you in the bowels of the Lord deliver up the crown. Bowels of the Lord, it's language that means mercy. In mercy, in loving kindness. Why? What happens if he doesn't do mercy? Unleash the dogs of war. Deliver up the crown and to take mercy on the poor souls for whom this hungry war opens his vasty jaws. Notice war is now personified. And on your head, turning the widow's tears, the orphan's cries, the dead men's blood, the private maiden's groans, for husbands, fathers, and betrothed lovers that shall be swallowed in this controversy. This is his claim, his threatening, and my message. Unless the Dauphin be in presence here, to whom expressly I bring greeting to. Okay, the prince is going to hit the ball back across the net, so to speak. Dauphin, for the Dauphin, I stand here for him. Notice he doesn't say, I am the Dauphin. He says, I stand here for him. What to him from England? Scorn and defiance. Slight regard, contempt, and anything that may not misbecome the mighty cinder doth he prize you at. Thus says my king, and if your father's highness do not, and grant of all demands at large, sweeten the bitter mock you sent his majesty, he'll call you to so hot an answer of it that caves and woomy voltages of France shall chide your trespass and return your mock and second accent of his ordinance. Okay? The Dauphin replies and says, notice what the Dauphin's reply is telling his father. The king didn't know that the Dauphin sent the joke sent the, the box with the tennis balls. Save my father, render fair return. It is against my will, for I desire nothing but odds with England. To that end, as matching to his youth and vanity, I did present him with the Paris balls. Okay, so now the, print, the, the king understands why the king of England is sending a message to the Dauphin. Exeter takes that and kind of runs with it. He'll make you, your Paris Louvre shake for it. We're at the mistress court of mighty Europe. And be assured you'll find a difference. As we his subjects have in wonder found. 
between the promise of his greener days and these he masters now. The promise of his greener days. He's not saying that his greener days showed promise. What's he saying? Yeah. The prophecy of his greener the, days. Yeah, the profligacy of his greener days. When he was a wanton, when he was a, a slacker. And those he masters now. And notice he said, and we stand in wonder. Now he weighs time even to the utmost green. That you shall read in your own losses if he stay in friends. King says, we'll let you know tomorrow. Okay? Chorus comes in and says, okay, imagine with me, if you will, our swift seeing flies in motion of no less celerity than that of thought. Suppose that you have seen the well-appointed king at Dover Pier embark his royalty and his brave fleet, and they sail across, and they land in France. Line 13, oh, do but think you stand upon the rivage and behold a city on the inconstant billows dancing. For so appears this fleet majestical holding due course to Harfleur. Follow, follow, grapple your mind to sternage of this navy. That is, they land. They go to the city, and then we get... No, 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 not St. Crispin's Day. Not high treason. There it is. Shout Factory yeah, yeah, yeah. Changing the channel. Well, 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 the ambassador from the French comes back, tells Harry that the king is offering Captain his daughter, and with a dowry, some tetiel of profitable pupils. The offer, like some nuts, and the new gunner, with wings stuck now, the devilish cannon touches, and down the doom to all they fall them! Once more, as the Greeks dare friend, once more, I'll close the war up with our English. The sky is fair and nature with hard favor, great day. Then the eye of terrible aspect, and it pried from the portage of the head like the brass cannon, and the frow, or one of it, as fearfully as the forbidden rock, or hang and jutty his confounded face, swelled with a wild and wasteful ocean. Now set the teeth and stretch the nostril wide, hold hard the breath, and bend up every spirit to his forehead. Oh no, you no blessing that Now attest that those whom you call fathers did beget you, and you, good yeoman, whose limbs were made in England, show us here the metal of your pasture, and I swear that you're worth your breathing, which I doubt not, but there is none of you so mean and base, that hath not noble luster in your eyes. I see you stand, like greyhounds in the slits, straining upon the start. The game's afoot, follow your spirit, and upon this charge, cry God for Halley! England and St. John! Okay. <clears throat> There's another um, comic scene with Bardolph and Nim and Pistol. And Flewellen, who's one of the captains of the army, he's Welsh, okay? Henry is Prince of Wales, born in Monmouth. He's also Welsh, okay? And so Falstaff's character 
is replaced in this play with the character of Fluellen. Fluellen provides us with a lot of the comedic um, capacity, let's say, that Falstaff did in the, in the Henry IV play. But it's a different kind of comic, or a different kind of comedy. This is comedy, you know, largely dealing with Fluellen's braggadocio, okay, which is, again, not like um, Falstaff. So we see Fluellen and Gower um, actually, I'm going to skip that. Yeah, we'll skip that. Going to 3 3. Pick up with Henry at the gates of, or the king, at the gates of Harfleur. Okay? We'd seen him just previously. They're, getting, they're trying to take, they don't take the city. And so now the king is asking essentially for a parley with the governor of the town. And he says, long speech, but this is one of the passages that a lot of moderns have real problems with, okay, because of the language that he uses. How yet resolves the governor of the town? This is the latest power we will admit. Therefore, to our best mercy, give yourselves, or like to men proud of destruction, defy us to our worst. For as I am a soldier, a name that in my thoughts becomes me best, if I begin the battery once again, I will not leave the half-achieved Harfleur till in her ashes, ashes she lie buried. Okay? Notice what he said. I am a soldier, a name that in my thoughts becomes me best. Meaning what? I'm okay. not a soldier, not a king. Yeah, exactly. That's what he thinks of himself as. I'm a soldier, okay? You don't submit, I don't stop until the town is nothing but ashes. The gates of mercy shall be all shut up. Okay, there's that theme of mercy again. The gates of mercy shall be all shut up and the fleshed soldier, rough and hard of heart, meaning the real soldier. The soldier in the midst of of battle. The soldier who has just seen maybe his comrade sliced down and is full of adrenaline and anger. What? In liberty a bloody hand shall range with conscience wide as hell mowing like grass your fresh fair virgins and your flowering infants. What is it then to me if, if, if impious war? Why is war described as impious? relative of mine, uncle, like two times removed, famously said, war is hell. No one ever said war is heaven. Why not? Because it destroys everything that is good. Okay? What is it then to me if impious, impious, unholy war, arrayed in flames like to the prince of fiends, Satan, anyone? Do with his smirched complexion all fell feats in linked to waste and desolation. Fell terrible feats. What is it to me when you yourselves are cause? If your pure maidens fall into the hand of hot and forcing violation. What rain can hold licentious Wickedness, notice, wickedness capitalized, war capitalized. Why? What's he doing? Okay, what else? He's personifying them. He's turning them, yeah, turning them into entities that act out. In the people. In the people. Rain can hold licentious wickedness when down the hill he holds his fierce career. Career, like you're on a sled at the top of a hill and you start going, you can't stop in the middle of the hill. You just keep head on going. We may as bootless, that is remediless, spend our vain command upon the enraged soldiers in their spoil and send precepts to the Leviathan to come ashore. We, we leaders, it would be as useless to try to tell our soldiers, 
boys, now stop that. That's not right. As it would be to tell Leviathan, the whale, come up on the shore. Not many whales are going to do that. Not many soldiers in the midst of battle are going to do that. Therefore, you men of Harfleur, take pity of your town and of your people, whilst yet my soldiers are in my command. Think about that. While I still control them. And it's almost like he's going, you know, and the leash is getting, getting almost too hard to hold on to. Whilst yet... The cool and temperate wind of grace, theological language again, overblows the filthy and contagious clouds of heady murder, spoil, and villainy. If not, why, in a moment look to see the blind and bloody soldier with foul hand defile the locks of your shrill shrieking daughter. Your fathers taken by the silver beards and their most reverend heads dashed to the walls. Your naked infants spitted upon pikes, whilst the mad mothers with their howls confused do break the clouds, as did the wives of Jewry at Herod's bloody hunting slaughtermen. What say you? Will you yield and this avoid? Guilty in defense be thus destroyed. Notice, he's laid a very clear choice at the feet of this governor. Submit and live. Fight and die. <laughs> but not just die. Watch your loved ones die horribly. This isn't going to be a battle where only the men are killed. This is going to be a battle like an Old Testament. Kill them all. Raise the place. Okay? Our expectation hath this day an end. What does he mean? Our expectation, our hope, has an end. The Dauphin, whom of succours we entreated, that is aid, comfort, help, we entreated returns us, that is, he sends word to us, that his powers are not yet ready to raise so great a siege, to stop you. Therefore, great king, we yield our town and life to thy soft mercy. Enter our gates, dispose of us and ours, for we no longer are defensible. Notice, we fall on your mercy. Come, Uncle Exeter, go you and enter our floor. There remain, fortified strongly against the French. Use mercy to them all. For us, dear uncle, the winter coming on and sickness growing upon our soldiers, we will retire to Calais. So he leaves Exeter in charge of Harfleur with a garrison of soldiers. Meanwhile, he and the rest of his troops are going to retire. They're going to backtrack, retreat to Calais on the French coast, okay? Which if you read about the news today, the French today attacked the immigrant, um, the refugee, whatever you want to call it, um, enclave at Calais. Is the right word? Well, maybe attacked, dispersed. I think the refugees consider it attacked, <laughs> okay? Because the refugees have been stopping, you know, kind of, Things going back, uh, ferries going back between Calais and, and England. They've been overcrowding ships to try to get to England. So, has the Dauphin matched Henry's um, parley, let's say, of the tennis balls? No. Okay. So we see a scene with Catherine and her, um, uh, what would you call her, Alice, the old gentlewoman, her chaperone almost, come in. And they have the scene spoken all in French, and we've got the English translation, okay? And what is Alice doing? Learning yeah, Catherine is learning English. Oh, I'm teaching. Yeah, Catherine, uh, Alice is teaching Catherine English, okay? So we have all this go on. 
And she's, you know, learning finger, hand, arm, leg, foot, you know, all this kind of stuff. Act 3, 5. The Dauphin and the king come in again. Okay? With Brittany. Brittany is the Count of Brittany. Okay? And the French king says, line 36, Where is Montjoy the Herald? Speed him hence. Let him greet England with our sharp defiance. Up, princes, and with spirit of honor edge, more sharper than your swords, high to the field. That is, get you hence. Move. And he names all these princes. Okay? Why? Bar Harry England that sweeps through our land with pennons painted in the blood of Harfleur. The king is angry. Rush on his host as doth the melted snow upon the valleys whose low vassal seat the Alps doth spit and void his room upon. Go down upon him, you have power enough, and in the captive chariot into Rouen, bring him our prisoner. He's saying, bring me Harry England. Okay. We get 3-6. We have a scene with Fluellen and Pistol and some others. Okay. And then Fluellen and the king. Um, Fluellen and the king around line 87 or so. And they talk back and forth. Notice Fluellen's language, by the way. He uses P's where normally we use B's. Why? That's part of his Welsh accent. Okay. There's a difference. It's called P-Celtic and Q-Celtic. P-Celtic is Wales and stuff. Q-Celtic is Manx and um, the Scottish islands and such. Okay. Where these bees instead of peaks. Um, so the king and Flewellen go back and forth. And then Montjoy comes in. Line 113. Montjoy says, you know me by my habit. Well then, I know thee. What shall I know of thee? My master's mind unfolded. Thus says my king, Say thou to Harry of England, Though we seemed dead, we did but sleep. England, excuse me, we did but sleep. Advantage is a better soldier than rashness. Tell him we could have rebuked him at Harfleur, But that we thought not good to bruise an injury Till it were full ripe. Now we speak upon our cue, and our voice is imperial. England shall repent his folly, see his weakness, and admire our sufferance. In other words, we let you take our floor. Bid him, therefore, consider of his ransom, which must proportion the losses we have borne. That is, the ransom Henry must pay to the king. Okay? in order for us not to attack you. Consider his ransom, which must proportion the losses we have borne, the subjects we have lost, and the disgrace we have digested. Which in weight to re-answer his pettiness would bow under. For our losses, his exchequer is too poor. He doesn't have the treasury to pay our losses. For the effusion of our blood, the muster of his kingdom is too faint a number. He doesn't have enough people in England to pay for the loss of our blood. He means to pay in blood for the loss of our blood. And for our own disgrace, his own person kneeling at our feet, but a weak and worthless satisfaction. In other words, you're too poor, your country's too scarce in terms of the number of people, but... I'll take you on your knees in front of me. All right? To this add defiance, and tell him for conclusion he hath betrayed his followers whose condemnation is pronounced. So far, my king and master, so much my office. That is, I'm done. What's thy name? I know thy quality. What does Henry mean when he says, I know thy quality? Yeah, but even more than that. I know what kind of man you are. The king is saying, you're good. You have quality. You are a good man. You do your job for your Lord well. And you don't shy away from it. 
Because, I mean, speaking to the king of England here, this, this is showing, you know, nerve. Montjoy. Thou dost thy office fairly. Turn thee back and tell thy king, I do not seek him now, but could be willing to march on to Calais without impeachment. That is, don't stop me, and I'll be at Calais. What's he saying? You want to meet with me? I'll see you at Calais. For to say the sooth, to, though tis no wisdom to confess so much unto an enemy of craft and vantage, my people are with sickness much enfeebled. My numbers lessen, those few I have, almost no better than so many French, who, when they were in health, I tell thee, Harold, I thought upon one pair of English legs, did march three Frenchmen. Okay. So he's just belittled the Frenchman. But he's also said, my men are sick. And my numbers are small. But that's okay because Englishmen are sturdier men than Frenchmen. Yet forgive me, God, that I do brag thus. This your heir of France hath blown that vice in me. French according to English, are known for being braggadocious. Thus, um, I must repent. Go, therefore, tell thy master, here I am. My ransom is this frail and worthless trunk. My army but a weak and sickly guard. God before, tell him we will come on. Though France himself and such another neighbor stand in our way. And he gives Montjoy a purse. He gives him money. Go bid thy master well advise himself. If we may pass, we will. If we be hindered, we shall your tawny ground with your red blood discolor. And so, Montjoy, fare you well. The sum of all our answer is but this. We would not seek a battle as we are, nor as we are. We say we will not shun it, so tell your majesty. He's saying, we're headed to Calais. We don't really want to fight you right now, but if you make us, we will. Okay. Montjoy leaves, and the king says, uh, Gloucester says, I hope they will not come upon us now. Because when the king says, my men are ill, he, they really are. And historically, they really were. His army was not in good shape. Okay, We're coming up to the famous Battle of Agincourt in 1415. Huge <coughs> English victory. Okay. We are in God's hands, brother, not in theirs. March to the bridge, it now draws toward night. Okay, so we have a little speech with the Dauphin, uh, excuse me, with the Constable and the um, Count of Orleans, or or Orleans. Okay, and then a messenger comes in. I'm skipping most of that scene. Uh, about line 125. Okay, the messenger comes in. My lord, high constable, the English lie within 1,500 paces of your tents. In other words, about a third of a mile. Take that back. 1,500 paces. No, it's just about a mile. Okay? Of your tents. Yeah, take that back. It's more like two-thirds of a mile. Who hath measured the ground? The lord Grand Prayer. Uh, Grand Prayer. A valiant, most expert gentleman. Would it were day. Alas, poor Harry of England, he longs not for the dawning as we do. Why? They need sunlight in order to fight this battle. What a wretched and peevish fellow is this king of England to mope with his fat brain followers so far out of his knowledge. If the English had any apprehension, they would run away. Or no, that they lack. For if their heads had any intellectual armor, they could never wear such heavy headpieces. Notice what they're doing. What do they think of the English? Not very much. Not very much. Okay. So what are they doing to their enemy? Among themselves. Underestimating them. Underestimating them. They're belittling them. And in belittling them, they're doing what? To their own mental preparedness. Lowering the level. Okay. Never underestimate, underestimate your enemy. So the chorus comes in, beginning of Act 4. 
Now entertain conjecture of a time when creeping murmur in the dark, pouring dark fills the wide vessel of the universe from camp to camp. So, the French are over here, and the English are less than a mile away. Okay? The English have their sentinels fixed out. The French have their sentinels. Each battle sees the other's umbered face. In other words, the English camp can see the French campfires. And the French campfires, or French can see the English campfires. So they know how close they are to their enemies. And the night slowly drags on. Because they know what's going to happen once the sun comes up. Okay? The armorers, the chorus tells us, line 12, accomplishing the knights with busy hammers, closing rivets up, give dreadful note of preparation. The, the armorers are reclosing torn armor, getting ready for the morning battle. Okay? We're told, line 25, and their gesture sad, investing link lean cheeks and war worn, worn coats, presenteth them unto the gazing moon so many horrid ghosts. Oh, now who will behold the royal captain of this ruined band, walking from watch to watch, from tent to tent? Let him cry praise and glory on his head. He's talking about the king walking from band to band. For forth he goes and visits all his hosts, bids them good morrow with a modest smile, calls them brothers, friends, and countrymen. Upon his royal face there is no note how dread an army hath enrounded him. That is, he gives no indication that he's outnumbered. Nor doth he dedicate one jot of color unto the weary and all watch at night, but freshly looks and overbears a taint with cheerful semblance and sweet majesty, that every wretch pining and pale before beholding him plucks comfort from his looks. A largesse universal like the sun, his liberal eye doth give to everyone, thawing cold fear that mean and gentle all. Behold, as may unworthiness define, a little touch of hairy in the night. See, he doesn't go disguised as irping him the entire time. The king is going from little groups of soldiers to little groups of soldiers as they huddle around their campfire. And he's going down and he's slapping them on the back. And he's encouraging them, calling them, we're told, uh, brothers, friends, countrymen. Can you imagine President Obama going out in the middle of Afghanistan, going around to a you know, troop? Oh, where are you? No. Okay. But this is Harry Monmouth. How did he spend his days before he was king? With these kind of people. Okay? These aren't all knights. This is the infantry. This is the food, the fodder for cannons that we're talking about. King comes in. Gloucester, tis true that we are in great danger. The greater therefore should our courage be. Good morrow, Brother Bedford, God Almighty. There is some soul of goodness in things evil. Would men observingly distill it out? Notice that. There is some soul of goodness in things evil. But what do you have to do? You have to distill those evil things. What does that mean? Remove all the impurity. Would men observingly distill it out? For our bad neighbor makes us early stirrers. That is... Probably many of you have experienced this if you live in a, either a dorm or apartment. Your loud neighbor makes you get up early or go to sleep late. Or maybe you're the loud neighbor. Then. Okay. Which is both healthful and good husbandry. Besides, they are our outward consciences and preachers to us all, admonishing that we should dress us fairly for our end. Meaning, we should, don't have a marker out, phrase I put on the board the other day, have some kind of memento mori, reminder of death. They are neighbors, he says, 
remind us that we're going to die. Thus may we gather honey from the weed and make a moral of the devil himself. So old Sir Thomas Erpingen comes in, and the king asks for his cloak. Okay. And Erpingham says, shall I attend? That is, shall I follow you? He goes, no, no, no. Go with my brother to the lords of England. That is, go to the high and mighty. Go to the highborn, the lords, the dukes, the nobles. What's Harry going to do? He's going to mingle with the riffraff. Okay. And so he talks with Pistol. Pistol asks, Chez vous là, who are you? A friend. Discuss unto me, art thou officer or art thou base, common and popular? I'm a gentleman of a company, trailst thou the twist on pike? Even so, what are you? As good a gentleman as the emperor, holy Roman emperor. Then you are better than the king? <laughs> the king's a balcock and a heart of gold. A lot of life, an imp of fame, a parent's good, a fist, a fist most valiant. I kiss his dirty shoe and from a heart string, meaning from his heart. I love the lovely bully. Okay, keep in mind, who is this? This is one of his buddies. Drinking buddies, whoring buddies, robbing buddies that he spent so much time with. False death's dead. Okay. What is thy name? <laughs> Harry Leroy. Okay. Harry Leroy. Yeah. Pistol uses French to ask who are you, but he doesn't know French, or at least he doesn't know it when he hears Harry Leroy, okay. which is anglicized French. Leroy a Cornish name. Art thou of Cornish crew? No, I'm a Welshman. No, thou Flewellen? Well, everybody knows Flewellen. Okay? Yes. Tell him I'll knock his leak about his pipe upon St. Davies Day. St. Davies Day, St. David is the patron saint of Wales. And it's today, actually. No, it's tomorrow. Tomorrow's St. David's Day. Do not you wear your dagger in your cap that day, lest he knock that about yours. Art thou his friend? Aye, his kinsman too. The Figo for thee, then. I thank you. God be with you. My name is Pistol. It sorts well with your fierceness. I mean, that's the king. Yeah, you are a pistol. You know? So then Gower and Flewellen come in. And the king overhears them a little bit. And the king says, Notice, soliloquy, it's two lines, but Flewellen and Gower leave, and we just have the king. Though appear a little out of fashion, there is much care and valor in this Welshman, talking about Flewellen. Some soldiers come in with Williams, and the king beats Williams. Okay. Williams, who goes there? A friend. Under what captain serve you? Under Sir Thomas Irping, a good old commander, a most kind gentleman. Pray you what thinks he for our state, even as men wrecked upon a sand that looked to be washed off the next tide. What does that mean? We're not in a very good position here. He hath not told us aught to the king. No, nor it is not me he should, for though I speak it to you, I think the king is but a man as I am. Pretty. Literally. Yeah, literally. <laughs> the violet smells to him as it doth to me. The element shows to him as it doth to me. All his senses have but human conditions. His ceremonies laid by, that is all the pomp that goes with his office, laid by, in his nakedness he appears but a man. And though his affections are higher mounted than ours, yet when they stoop, they stoop with the like wing. Therefore, when he sees reason of fears, as we do, his fears out of doubt be of the same relish as ours are. Yet in reason no man should possess him with any appearance of fear, lest he by showing it should dishearten his army. He may show what outward courage he will, but I believe it's cold enough as to this. He could wish himself in Thames up to the neck. And so I would he were, and I buy him at all adventures, so we were quit here. What has Bate just said? Wish he was dead so we go. Close. 
but not quite. Where did he say he wished the king were? Back in England. Back in England, up in the Thames. He's talking about Windsor, which castle is right on the bank of the Thames. I wish the king were back in England. Why? Because all of us would be back in England too. Yeah, it's cold and wet in England. At least we're going to die. Okay. The king replies, By my troth, I will speak my conscience of the king. I think he would not wish himself anywhere but where he is. Then I would he were here alone. Ooh. It's almost close to treason. <laughs> So should he be sure to be ransomed in many a poor man's lives saved. See, the French aren't going to kill the king. They didn't do that. They didn't kill kings. They didn't kill nobles in medieval warfare. Not generally speaking. Usually, they were captured. You bought them off with ransom. They go back home. I dare say you love him not so ill to wish him here alone. I swear you speak this to feel other men's minds. Methinks I could not die anywhere so contented as in the king's company. His cause being just and his quarrel honorable, notice how the king qualifies his statement. If the king's cause is just and his quarrel honorable, then I could not die anywhere so contented as in the king's company. Williams, that's more than we know. In other words, above my pay grade. I don't know if this cause is just. I don't know if this quarrel is honorable. Aye, or more than we should seek after, says Bates. For we know enough if we know we are the king's subjects. If his cause be wrong, our, our obedience to the king wipes the crime of it out of us. And that was a medieval notion. Okay? If the king falsely, wrongly, lead you into battle and you die in that battle and you die and go to your judge the king is wrong but you are not why? you're just following orders and the king is God's representative on earth therefore you are following God's representative on earth if you read the introduction to Richard II it talked a lot about that Doctrine of passive obedience, which Henry VIII, Henry, Edward VI, and Elizabeth also really played up a lot. Okay? Williams. But if the cause be not good, the king himself hath a heavy reckoning to make. When all those legs and arms and heads chopped off in a battle shall join together at the latter day and cry at such and such a place. And I don't even have to go on. I mean, think of what he's saying there. If the king is wrong, then at the judgment day, all the dead of Ajankur will stand at that judgment seat and say, we died because of him. And we may have died unshriven, unforgiven, uncommuned, un, uh, without an opportunity for last rites and such. Some swearing, some crying for a surgeon, some upon their wives left poor behind them, some upon the debts they owe, some upon their children while they left. I am afeard there are few die well that die in a battle, for how can they charitably, charitably dispose of anything when blood is their argument? Now, if these men do not die well, it will be a black matter for the king that led them to it. And to disobey, we're against all proportion of subjection. And what does the king do? <laughs> no, 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 no. You're not going to lay that on my soul. So, if a son that is, sent, that is by his father sent about merchandise to sinfully miscarry upon the sea, the imputation of his wickedness by your rule should be imposed upon his father that sent him. In other words, if a father sends a son upon some business on the ocean, and the son's a horrible sailor, and sinks and dies, he gets to blame his father for it? Because of his own inability? 
Or, if a servant under his master's command, transporting a sum of money, be assailed by robbers and die in many irreconciled iniquities, you may call the business of the master the author of the servant's damnation? No, 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 no. The king is not bound to answer the particular endings of his soldiers, the father of his son, nor the master of a surgeon, for they purpose not their deaths when they propose their services. In other words, the individual soldiers or the son or the servant are responsible for what? They're responsible for this and what goes along with that. To be prepared. That is to have their souls prepared. Besides, there is no king. Be his cause, never so spotless, if it come to their arbitrament of swords, can try it out with all unspotted soldiers. In other words, there aren't saint soldiers. <laughs> Some, poor adventure, have on them the guilt of premeditated and contrived murder. Some, beguiling virgins with the broken seals of perjury. In other words, they lie to get in their beds. Some, making the wars their bulwark, that have before gored the gentle bosom of peace with pillage and robbery. Some go to war because they're afraid they're going to get caught by the cops back at home. Now, if these men have defeated the law and outrun native punishment, though they can outstrip men, they have no wings to fly from God. They think they can outrun the law, but you can't outrun the law. War is his beetle. Okay? Look at your um, footnote. Parish off officer responsible for punishing petty offenders. War is God's beetle. God uses war to punish people. Men are punished for before breach of the king's laws, and now the king's quarrel. Where they fear the death, they've borne life away. Where they would be safe, they perish. Then, if they die and provided, no more is the king guilty of their damnation. Okay? Williams. Oh, yeah, that's true. Tis certain every man dies ill. The ill upon his own head. King's not to answer for that. Bates, I don't desire he should answer for me, and yet I determine to fight lustily for him. That is, I'm going to give it my all. I myself heard the king say he would not be ransomed. Uh, he said so. To make us fight cheerfully. Notice what Williams is saying. He's lying to us. But when our throats are cut, he may be ransomed, and we're never the wiser. If I live to see it, I will never trust his word after. Well, then you pay him. Okay. The king and Williams go back and forth, and they exchange gloves, because Williams says, okay, let it be a quarrel between us if you live. I embrace it. How shall I know thee again? Give me any gauge of thine, and I will wear it in my bonnet, and if ever thou darest acknowledge it, I will make it my quarrel. Here's my glove. And the king gives him his glove. Okay. Everybody leaves. And we have the king, and he gets a nice long soliloquy upon the king. Let us our lives, our souls, our debts, our careful wives, our children, and our sins lay on the king. We must bear all. Oh, hard condition. Twin born with greatness, subject to the breath of every fool who since no more can feel but his own ringing. What infinite heart's ease must kings neglect that private men enjoy? Remember Henry IV's disquisition on sleep? Why is it the commoner can sleep like a baby on straw and board? And I who have the most sumptuous bed in the kingdom. I awake at night. Here, how? What infinite heart's ease must kings neglect that private men enjoy? And what of kings that privates have not too? Save ceremony, save general ceremony. That is, kings have ceremony. Private people don't. That's all that kings have, he's saying. And where art thou, thou idle ceremony? What kind of God art thou? Can you, I shouldn't say this, but 
Can you imagine, God forbid, Donald Trump gets elected president, what kind of ceremony he will have? For himself. Yeah. Because it'll be huge, you know. <laughs> it'll be the greatest. It'll be, you know, the most wonderful. Okay? I mean, look at what the king is saying here. What art thou, thou idol ceremony? What kind of God art thou that sufferest more of mortal griefs than do thy worshipers? What are thy rents? What are thy comings in? That is the income. Oh, ceremony, show me but thy worth. What, what is thy soul of adoration? Art thou aught else but place, degree, and form, creating awe and fear in other men? Wherein thou art less happy, excuse me, being feared than they in fearing? What drinks thou oft instead of homage sweet but poison flattery? Oh, be sick, great greatness, and bid thy ceremony give thee cure. Thinks thou the fiery fever will go out with titles blown from adulation? Will it give place to flexure and low bending? Canst thou, when thou commands the beggar's knee, command the health of it? He's talking about the title of king. When you command the beggar to kneel, can you command the beggar's knee to be well so that he can kneel? No, thou proud dream that plays so subtly with a king's repose. I am a king that find thee, and I know tis not the balm, the scepter, and the ball, the sword, the mace, the crown imperial, the intertissued robe of gold and pearl, the farced title running for the king, the throne he sits on, nor the tide of pomp that beats upon the high shore of this world. No, not all these thrice gorgeous ceremony, not all these laid in bed majestical, can sleep so soundly as the wretched slave who with a body filled and vacant mind gets him to rest crammed with distressful bread. Never sees horrid night the child of hell but like a lackey from the rise to set, sweats in the eye of Phoebus, works during the sun, and all night sleeps in Elysium. What's Elysium? Heaven. Yeah. It's the blessed fields. He is. Yeah. Dead to the world in his sleep. Next day after dawn doth rise and help Hyperion to his horse. In other words, he rises at dawn and goes about his work again. And follows so the ever running year with profitable labor to his grave. Ever running year. Year after year after year after year until he dies. And but for ceremony, such a wretch winding up days with toil and nights with sleep had the forehand and vantage of a king. Notice tennis metaphor there. The slave, a member of the country's peace, enjoys it. But in gross brain, little watts, that is little nose, what watch the king keeps to maintain the peace, whose hours the peasant best advantages. What keeps the king up at night? Everything that makes the peasant sleep. <laughs> Worrying about the kingdom. Okay. Here's a king up for that 3 a.m. call, <laughs> supposedly. Enter Erpingham. Okay. He and Erpingham talk back and forth a little bit, and then Erpingham gins, goes, and the king continues. Let me go more quickly. <clears throat> and the king continues his speech. Oh, God of battles. St 
steal my soldiers' hearts. This is a prayer. Possess them not with fear. Take from them now the sense of reckoning, ere the opposed numbers pluck their hearts from them. Not today, O Lord. Oh, not today. Think not upon the fault my father made encompassing the crown. Compassing. Taking it. I, Richard's body, have interred new, and on it have bestowed more contrite tears than from it issued forced drops of blood. Okay? He's taken Richard's body, he's reinterred it, he's given it proper burial, he's had masses sung over it. Five hundred poor I have in yearly pay, who twice a day their withered hands hold up toward heaven. To pardon blood. That is, five times, a, uh, two times a day, 500 people pray for the soul of Richard. And I have built two chantries where the sad and solemn priests sing still for Richard's soul. More <laughs> will I do, though all that I can do is nothing worth, since that my penitence comes after all, imploring pardon. Okay, go to, I'm going to skip 4-2, 4-3, the biggie. They're getting ready for the battle, and Gloucester comes in and says, where's the king? The king himself is rode to view their battle. Of fighting men, they have full three score thousand. The French had 60,000, the English had 12. I always get this wrong. The French had 60,000. The English either had 5,000 or 12,000. It was either 5 to 1 or 12 to 1. I think it was 5. I think it was 12 to 1. I think the English had 5,000. Hugely outnumbered. Okay? No, take the back. It is, yeah, it is 5 to 1. There's 5 to 1. Besides, they all are fresh. So the English have um, 12,000. Salisbury, God's arm strike with us. Tis a fearful odds. God be with you, princes all. I'll to my charge. If we no more meet till we meet in heaven, then joyfully my noble lord of Bedford, my dear lord Gloucester, and my good lord Exeter, and my kind kinsmen, warriors all, adieu. Okay. Farewell, good Salisbury. And then Exeter says uh, some things. Westmoreland. Oh, that we had now had here but one ten thousand of those men in England that do no work today. Uh, which one is that? That's Lawrence Olivier. May I just ask a question? Sure. So this battle, was it fought a field battle or a siege battle? This is a siege, uh, field battle. This is out in the open. Okay. Um, French largely on horseback, English largely not. Okay. Uh, the way the English won the battle was because of the English longbow. Most of their most of the French cavalry were taken out by arrows. Okay. We just read this look of the king talking. Do you think he's kind of questioning this, like what it means to be a king, and if this is the, you know, either way, like, you know, somebody has to suffer? Do you think that that's kind of what he's relating to, or what do you think the purpose of that is? Of the soliloquy? Yeah. Well, I mean, the the previous one, it's a prayer. Yeah. I mean, he's just, he's just asking God, give my men strength to make it through today. The previous one, um, I think Henry is, or Harry, is just relating. You know, they, they don't know what it's like. They look at me, and the commoners look at the king, and what do they think? People look at Queen Elizabeth today. What do they think? I know it's not a fair analogy because she, she doesn't, doesn't make any major of, decisions. It's, still all pomp and circumstance. it's all pomp and circumstance. They think the king is everything, you know, made and set for him. And he's saying, the only difference between me and them is ceremony. He doesn't mean ceremony like a ceremony. He means everything that goes with the title of king. But take that away, and what is he? Just the maker. It's just a man. In fact, we're going to see all that taken away in King Lear. 
We're going to see a king who abdicates the throne. He gives it away to his daughters. Okay? Gives all the pomp, all the circumstance away. He wants to retain some of that. He doesn't realize you give up the kingship, it means you're nobody. Okay? And he has to wrestle with that. This king doesn't want to give that away. He thinks he is it kind of by right, but that's why he also prays to God. And he says, you know, and I, to pardon how I got the throne, I'm doing this stuff for Richard. I'm having, you know, Richard's uh, prayers said for him. Pardon him, okay, and pardon me while you're at it. Okay, so I'm going to show three different versions. This is um, Kenneth Branagh's first of the St. Crispin's Day speech. Yeah, yeah, skip it. Fighting men. They have fallen three score thousand. That's five to one. Besides, they are all fresh. Okay, remember, the English are sick. They hadn't gone to Calais. This is on the way, so the French caught up. What she that wishes so? My cousin Westmoreland. Turn this up. This is so good. It's one of the best speeches in English literary history. We are marked to die. We are enough to do our country loss. And if to live, the Pause for just one moment. After you hear this, think of a film, a re relatively recent film. There's a sequel to this film coming out this summer where somebody took essentially the St. Crispin's Day speech and updated it for an American audience. You are men Great speech. Great share of honor. God's will, I pray, they wish not one man more. Rather, proclaim it, Westmoreland, through my host, that he which hath no stomach to this fight, let him depart. His passport shall be made, and crowns for convoy put into his purse. We're going to see a he very young Christian Bale in here, too. About ten years to old. Die with us. This day is called the Feast of Crispian. He. The night lives this day and comes safe home will stand a tip Right there, sitting on the name. Him. And arouse him at the name of Crispian. He that shall see this day and live old age will hear thee on the vigil, feast his neighbors, and say, Tomorrow is St. Crispin's. Then will he strip his sleeve and show his scars and say, These wounds I had on Crispin's day. Old men forget, yet all shall be forgot, but he'll remember with advantages what feats he did that day. Then shall our names, familiar in their mouths as household words. Harry the King, Bedford and Exeter, Warwick and Talbot, Salisbury and Gloucester, be in their flowing cups freshly remembered. This story shall a good man teach his son, and Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by. From this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England now are dead shall think themselves accursed they were not here, and hold down their hoods cheap, while then he speaks the thought with us upon St. Crispin's Day! Okay. And then... I think the actor watched this when he was preparing for that scene, for that, uh... Scene in Independence Day. Yeah. What's he that wishes so? My cousin Westmoreland? No, my fair cousin. If we are marked to die, we are enough to do our country loss. And if to live, the fewer men, the greater share of honor. 
God's will, I pray thee. Wish not one man. Sorry, the quality's not so great. Rather proclaim it, Westmoreland, through my host, that he which hath no summer to his feast, let him depart. His passport shall be drawn, and in France for convoy put into his purse. We would not die in that man's company that fears his fellowship to die with us. This day is called the Feast of Crispian. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when this day is named and rouse him at the name of Crispian. He that shall live this day and see old age will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbors and say, tomorrow is St. Crispian. Then will he strip his sleeve and show his scars and say, these wounds I had on Crispin's day, old men forget, yet all shall be forgot, but he'll remember with advantages what feats he did that day. Then shall our names, familiar in his mouth as household words, Harry the King, Bedford and Exeter, Warwick and Talbot, Salisbury and Gloucester, be in their flowing cups freshly remembered. This story shall the good man teach his son. And Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother, be he ne'er so base. And gentlemen in England now abed shall think themselves a curse they were not here, and hold their manhoods cheap. Why of any speech that fought with us upon St. Crispin's Day? <laughs> okay. Oh, I hadn't been aware of this one. Okay, I've got to play that one. Just for Richard Burton's voice. At Chili's, lunch combos come with your choice of soup or salad and a side of home style fries. Order from over 15 different lunch combos for just six, seven, or eight bucks.
Okay. Notice what he's doing with that, with the rhetoric in that. What did he essentially say when he was walking and talking with Williams and Bates and then with the first part of the soliloquy? What's the difference between the king and a normal man? Well, one has ceremony, the other one does. Here, what does he say is going to happen as a result of their fighting together on St. Crispin's Day? We brothers. We band of brothers. There will be no, there will be no ceremony separating them. He said, you know, we will be comrades, you know. Men, years from hence, will say, oh, I got that scar, you know, and the king will be able to say, oh, I got that scar, you know, along with them, okay? So they have the battle. We're going to skip a bunch. Um, go on to four, six, okay? Battle's going on, and we find out the boys have been killed. The boys are the boys who watch after the soldiers' um, horses, accoutrements, belongings, things like that. During the battle, they stay off in the back. They have a kind of like a pinned-in area. And we have the king say, 4-6, uh, line 32. I blame you not for hearing this. I must perforce compound with misful eyes, or they will issue too. But hark what new alarm is this. The French have reinforced their scattered men. Then every soldier kill his prisoners. Okay, keep in mind, the idea wasn't just out and out slaughter. It was to capture prisoners who would then be ransomed, as I said. Give the word through. So the end of 4-6, the king says, tell every man, kill the prisoners he has. 4-7 opens immediately. Flewellen and Gower walk on the stage. Kill the poison, the luggage. Tis expressly against the law of arms. Tis an as an piece of knavery. Mark you now as can be offered. In your conscience now is it not. Tis certain there's not a boy left alive. And the cowardly rascals that ram from the battle have done this slaughter. That is, French soldiers who fled the field of battle, went and killed the unarmed boys. Okay? Besides, they have burned and carried away all that was in the king's tent. Wherefore, the king most worthily hath caused every soldier to cut his prisoner's throat. Gower says, this is why the king gave the order. Okay? Oh, tis a gallant king. Okay. The king comes in, line 54, I was not angry since I came to France until this instant. And in the film, in the Branagh film, if I remember right, it's when the king is overseeing, looking at the slaughtered boys. Take a trumpet, Harold, ride thou unto the horsemen on yon hill. If they will fight with us, bid them come down or void the field. They do offend our sight. If they'll do neither, we will come to them. He's telling the herald, not Montjoy, his own herald, go tell the French horsemen, either get your butts down here and fight us, or we're going to come get you. And make them scur away as swift as stones and force it from the old Assyrian sling. Besides, we'll cut the throats of those we have, and not a man of them that we shall take shall taste our mercy. Go, tell them so. Montjoy comes in. Okay, the last time Montjoy came in, the king said, that's it, no more. <laughs> you don't get any grant of travel mercy. Okay? No, so not that I find these bones of mine for ransom. Comest thou again for ransom? No, great king. I come to thee for charitable license, that we may wander over this bloody field to book our dead. That is, to write their names in the book of the dead. And then to bury them, to sort our nobles from our common men. For many of our princes, woe well, the while I drowned and soaked in mercenary blood. Blah, blah, blah. And King's like, I, I, I don't know who won. I tell thee truly, Harold, I know not if the day be ours or no. 
for yet a many of our horse, your horsemen peer and gallop o'er the field. The day is yours. 60,000 to 12,000. Where is this? They call it Agincourt. Then call we this the field of Agincourt, fought on the day of Crispin Crispianus. So Llewellyn comes up, and he and the king joke. Not really joke. It's a cathartic experience. They're relieving, you know, their anger. Llewellyn. Your majesty says very true. If your majesty is remembered of it, the Welshmen did good service in a garden where leeks did grow, wearing leeks in their monmouth caps, which your majesty know to this hour is an honorable badge of the service. And I do believe your majesty takes the scorn to wear the leek upon St. Tavy's Day, that is, on St. David's Day. I wear it for a memorable honor, for I am Welsh, you know, good countrymen, all the water and why. The Wye River that separates England from Wales, in southern Wales, cannot wash your majesty's Welsh blood out of your body. I can tell you that, I, God bless it, and preserve it as long as it pleases your grace and his majesty too. Okay. Skip a bunch. We have the scene where the king and Williams and Erpingham kind of come back together again. Okay, remember, king and Williams, they exchanged. Gauges, and now the king is wearing Williams's gauge, and Williams is kind of like, uh, <laughs> oops. <laughs> but the king treats him honorably because the er Williams didn't know who he was. Okay, chorus comes in. I'm going through quickly, and we get the king meeting with the French king, Act Five, Scene Two, and I've got. I'm not going to do the hollow crown. Uh, let's do this one. Back up. Sorry. Shut up. Um, here, let's show this too. This is when Montjoy comes in for that, the day is yours. And then we'll get to the Catherine and more, that's my boy, Pearl. The Catherine and uh, King Harry scene. So one will look bounty can last longer. So you get more life, Pearl. Bounty, the long-lasting, quicker picker-upper. That's Flewellen. That's Christian Bale. His first acting, I think. Kill the boys in the left ditch. It is expressly against the law of arms. Tis as Sarah, that piece of memory mark you know what can be offered. In your conscience now, is it not? Sir, it's not a boy. Praise it be God, and not our strength for it. 
Okay. <clears throat> now jump forward quite a bit. Um, we're going to skip a lot of the, the um, negotiations, let's say, in Act 5, Scene 2, where the king and the duke and Burgundy and others are reaching their peace agreement, let's say, and pick up with... About line 98, I think, is where this clip um, picks up. I'm hoping this is the longer one. The fucking Slava fellow of this temple here could never look in his glass for love of anything he sees there, let thy eye be like <coughs> I speak to thee, plain soldier, if thou canst love me for this, take me. If not to say to thee that I shall die, it is true, but for thy love, by the Lord knows. Yet I love thee too. If thou would have such a one, take me. And take me, take a soldier. Take a soldier. Take a king. And what sayest thou then to my love? Speak, my fair. And fairly too, I pray thee. Is it possible that I should love the enemy of France? No. It is not possible that you should love the enemy of France, Kate. But in loving me, you should love the friend of France. For I love France so well that I will not part with a village of it. I will have it all mine. And Kate, when France is mine, then I am yours. And yours is France, and you are mine. I cannot tell what is that. No, Kate. I will. Tell me in French, hmm. which I'm sure will hang about my tongue like a new married wife about her husband's neck, hardly to be shook off. <laughs> Je prends sur le position de France et uh, quand vous avez le position uh, de moi, uh, 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 donc. Uh, Votre et France, et vous êtes mien. It is as easy for me, Kate, to come to the kingdom as to speak so much more French. I will never move thee in French unless you're going to laugh at me. Le français que vous parlez est meilleur que l'homme de lequel tu parles. No, it is not. Well, can any of your neighbors tell Kate? I'll ask them. <sighs> Sorry about that. <clears throat> so they go kind of back and forth. Um, she agrees, and they marry. So what's Shakespeare suggesting, or what's he doing in this play? You know, it's, it's not necessarily something that he does in all of the plays. Um, because every major scene... And I mean this beyond the mere obvious. Every major scene, we see Harry or Hal accomplish what he goes about accomplishing. How? Through speech. Through rhetoric. Through, through the persuasive arts. He persuades Kate to marry him by saying... You won't be marrying the enemy of France. You'll be marrying the greatest friend of France. Why? Because when you marry me, I'll be the king of France, and then France will be yours, you know, etc. It seems to me that one of the things Shakespeare is doing is he's teaching his audience. And keep in mind, this, I mean, his audience is, for this play, is right around 1600. Okay? There's a, there's a lot of of um, pent-up anxiety in England as to what's going to happen to England when Queen Elizabeth dies. Who's going to become 
Who's going to become the ruler? They did not know about the deal she had with James VI of Scotland. Okay? Um, that Shakespeare is emphasizing language. Okay? Because language in and of itself was an important issue of the day at the time. One of the reasons is because the language is undergoing change. In Shakespeare's day, we have the, the transference or the transformation from kind of medieval English, late middle English to what's called early modern English. We have going on, we're right in the middle of what's called the great vowel shift, where all these vowels are shifting so that, you know, words like This and this don't rhyme like they do today. This is say. This rhymes with this. Okay? But it's starting to change in Shakespeare's day. So he's playing with language, showing the fluidity of, um, of language at the time. But at the same time, he's emphasizing the use of rhetoric, the use of the persuasive arts to achieve what you need to achieve without warfare. Okay? All right, we'll stop there. I don't have the exams. I'm going to, uh, I'll email them to you and, and put it up on D2L, which is due in two weeks. Um, and then in two weeks, we do Midsummer Night's Dream, I believe it is. Next week, spring break. Um, is the exam going to be Dropbox or do we bring it in? No, you'll bring it in.